Okay. Um, yeah, we have a couple of attendees on now. Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Nicole. Um, I'm a rising senior at Swarthmore College. I'm currently interning for Represent Women as an outreach and advocacy intern. Um, thank you so much for joining today. It's a five part um, talk series and today is the first part which is Represent Women 101. Um, so our plan for today is to hopefully give you a general overview of the organization, our mission, um, some of our research projects and why they're important to us. And then towards the end of the webinar, we'll discuss briefly the internship opportunities um, and one other intern and I will speak on our own experiences working with Represent Women this summer. And we'll particularly touch on the remote experience. Um, and then tomorrow for everyone that registered today, they'll, they should receive an email invitation with a link where it'll just be one singular link and you can sign up for as many of the remaining four parts of the talk series, um, which are gonna be happening at the same time every Tuesday. And we encourage everyone to follow us on social media for updates on the talk, but also on our current projects and research. And we'll also provide um, everyone who registered with action steps and links via email after the talk today. Um, so thank you so much for joining. Um, I'll let everyone else introduce themselves and then we can dive in. I am Cynthia Terrell and I'm the director of Represent Women. I'm Laura Riley and I'm the research fellow for Represent Women. Uh, my name is Lola Solis, and I am a research intern for Represent Women. Hi, my name is Claire Hatfield, and I am a legal research intern for Represent Women. And Cynthia, I don't know if you're going to introduce me, but I am Susanna Welford, and I'm the CEO and founder of Running Start, but I'm also a very proud board member of Represent Women. Thank you. I so um, maybe given, go ahead, Nicole. Sorry, just about the general sort of timeline for the next um, parts, which will also be on the link. Um, but so for part two, well, we encourage anyone definitely, especially if you want to, are thinking about applying for one of the internship opportunities, definitely to listen into all of the parts as they'd be like really beneficial um, just to learn more about what you could possibly be doing and just more about like everyone in the organization. Um, and part two can more be geared towards people to learn and familiarize yourselves with other types of voting and voting reforms. Um, part three is a bit more tailored towards donors. Um, part four is focused on learning about women representation um, and feminism and people are interested in the history of women in politics. And then part five is meant for people, particularly in the US, so they can learn more about what women representation looks like in other parts of the world. That's great. Good. Well, maybe given uh, Susanna's time constraints, we should have uh, Susanna start off. And Susanna, if you could tell us a little bit about um, Running Start and why you started it and what I've heard you tell the um, origin story, I believe, and it's an entertaining tale. Uh, so you could do a shortened version of that and maybe talk about some highlights of what your intern team is doing this summer and then a, a little bit about how you see uh, the, the mission and the work of um, Running Start and Represent Women Knitting Together. Yeah, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, I am, as I said, a very proud board member of Represent Women. And um, maybe maybe I'll start with um, just a little brief part about Running Start, but then I think I should start with telling you why I think Represent Women's work dovetails so beautifully with Running Starts. Mm -hmm. So. Um, our really quick and dirty origin story is that um, back in 1999, um, I was working at a law firm um, and got to work with Governor Ann Richards, who had been governor of Texas right before George Bush. And I was 30, I think at the time. And it was the first time in my life I had really had it laid out for me clearly that women have a different 
um, path to leadership than men do, and that it's harder for us, and that there are all sorts of reasons that women don't see themselves as leaders. So fast forward, I, I started um, a political action committee to help women get into politics back in 1999, I co-founded that. And then in 2007, I founded Running Start um, because there were not enough women running for office. And I thought if women are not running for office uh, in nearly the numbers of, that men do, then we should go back to the, the point in their lives where women are thinking about what they can become, what they can accomplish with their lives, who they can be, and insert politics into that so that they understand that politics is a place where they can, they can succeed. They can, they can go into politics and they can change problems that maybe their life experience uniquely gives them um, a window into. Because I probably don't have to tell anybody listening today that um, Congress still, despite incredible elections recently, it is still you know, the vast majority are men and um, the vast majority are white and the vast majority are older. So trying, uh, Running Start is all about trying to get different types of people into politics and encouraging people who think there's nobody like me who is um, running for office to think, yeah, I could actually do it. And um, the reason that we are such an awesome fit with Represent Women is I love what Running Start does, obviously, right? You know, I founded the organization because I really believe that this is a true path to getting more women into office. Start early, work with them on their leadership skills. They'll see that they can run for office and they can run. But there are so many different paths that we need to be pursuing all at the same time if we're ever going to get a real balance of power between men and women. And so I met Cynthia, I don't even know how long ago. I mean, I feel like it was maybe even before Running Start or, or shortly after I, um, I founded Running Start. And um, she basically sold me absolutely on this concept that if we don't change the systems that help um, women, uh, people of color, people who are not usually um, considered for elections, if we don't change those systems that keep those people out, then um, my efforts are never going to perfectly succeed. And so I think that that the whole, all the work of Represent Women, it's so important because it basically, it's tackling a whole different side of this problem than what I tackle um, day to day. It's basically saying, once these women are bold enough to decide to run, then they're going to have systems that actually help them to get into office. Um, and so if you are new to Represent Women, which maybe you are if you're on this call, um, look at the work they're doing because it is, it's a little, um, what's the best word? Not complicated, but the, the ideas are, um, you have to dig into the ideas uh, to really understand exactly how it all flows, but it is one of the most important things that we're doing, not just to get women in, but to get people of color in and to get different representation in politics. And okay. And the only other thing that, um, you asked me to talk about was, Cynthia asked me to talk about our interns and what we're doing this summer. So we, um, for years, every time I talk about Running Start, I say as one of our biggest selling points, we don't do anything online. We bring everybody in person to these events so that they can, we can look in their eyes and say, you should run for office. And so we can't do that anymore. And we had um, a very, very busy March and April redesigning all of our programs so that they were online. And every summer since 2007, um, our very first year, we have brought in high school students from all around the country for a week of political leadership training. And so it just started on last Monday. Um, it's you know, been going for a little bit more than a week. And we've decided to make it a six week course. It's obviously all virtual and so far so good. And we have actually, the way we have um, changed our intern program is we um, all, everybody's virtual obviously. And each of the interns is assigned to a team of the high school students and that's what they do this summer. So they're, they're going to help shepherd these, the students in our high school program through the program, help them with their campaign simulation. So it's actually really fun. They're gonna really get to know a group of our Running Start participants um, really, really closely. Um, so it's been, it has been great so far. And the interesting thing, and I don't know what you're thinking, Cynthia, about how you proceed from here, but um, 
it's going so well. And we've done a couple of other programs. We've, we've successfully done them online. We may keep it. We may, I think we'll bring people in person when we can, but we may um, every summer have this as one of the um, options of what we do because, um, you know, sometimes we don't like to think about it, but there are advantages sometimes to being able to gather people from disparate places and get them all in line at the same time. Uh, did I cover everything, Cynthia? Is there anything more you want me to discuss? Could you say a word? One thing that uh, Susanna and I uh, were involved in the beginning of was this Reflect Us Coalition. That's a group of nonpartisan women's representation organizations. You could just say a minute's worth, Susanna, on the, um, the opportunity for organizing across the ideological spectrum. You've, you're doing great work across the age spectrum. Uh, I, I uh, salute Amber for being in the middle of the country where not a lot of women's organizations are based. So mm -hmm. she's like trying to do the, the you know, between the coasts. And, um, but I think that the nonpartisan, both Amber and, well, Amber, Susanna and myself, all I think really are um, eager to uh, redefine what it is to be an advocate for women's representation, which means that actually everybody has their voice heard and feels represented and is represented in government. But maybe you want to amplify that quickly, Susanna. Um, yeah, that is, that's absolutely right. So uh, this coalition that Cynthia was just talking about, um, it was made up originally of nine groups, I think. And we each sort of had a piece of the puzzle. Um, Running Start and Ignite did the younger women um, vote run lead and she should run, worked with women who were, you know, a couple stages um, uh, past Running Start. Um, so in their 20s and 30s and 40s, who were closer to actually being ready to run. Then you had Higher Heights, which was focusing exclusively on helping to get African-American women into politics and Latinas represent doing that on the Latina side. Um, and we we have worked, I don't think they were part of this coalition, but we've worked with Victory Fund, you know, helping to get LGBT people into office. So I think it's really, there's a really beautiful movement going on where people are saying American government should represent the people that make up America. And right now, as we said before, it, it's it's old, white, we, they, they call it pale, stale, and male. Male, pale, and stale. Anyway, it's one of those things. And so there's this, there's this wonderful movement right now of people trying to change the face of politics and make it way more representative of, of who this country really is. Yeah, that's great. And Susanna and I also um, uh, work with people who are doing international work, which we can talk about more in our session on uh, international women's representation, but that's been a fun connection also, working with groups like Vital Voices, and I've been working uh, with the State Department programs, um, traveling, getting to know people who are doing work in support of the UN Sustainable Development Goals on women's representation. Um, so there's a whole world outside US borders in some ways where the conversation is is more sophisticated about about systems that need to change um, to to advance women's representation. So anyway, that's well, a connection as well. Yeah, I, I always think when I do the international things, um, it, it makes me um, feel better about America and worse about America. And the um, the the better is that everybody seems to have very similar problems to we do, like to what we do. They they talk about the same things, holding women back. But um, the times when I feel worse about our, our country is, oh my gosh, there are so many light years, so many countries are light years ahead of um, where the U.S. is in terms of women's rights. And um, one day, hopefully, we'll be having discussions like they do about, you know, is our maternity care uh, too long, <laughs> which, you know, we're not having that conversation um, yeah. currently. That's true. I think we're we're 80 or so. Maura can correct me. We're maybe we're 82 or 83 now, uh, worldwide for women's representation. And 20 years ago, we ranked about 60th. So not only are we behind, but we're falling further behind. Yeah, we are. But I I think you know Cynthia and I were connected to women's groups around the world who are working to get more women into um, into leadership and into power. And it's it is. It's sobering to think that nowhere in the world do they have it perfect. Even places like Iceland that will say they're the best in the world, they, they probably are, but they still have a lot of, um, they still have disparities between power of women and men. But there are a lot of great people working to, um, to write the balance. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, and that's a good segue maybe uh, to think about the, the suffrage centennial year that we're in uh, because Amber McReynolds has done um, some really full, uh, phenomenal work with a book she wrote called When Women Vote. And she's also uh, a Represent Women board member, which is great to have two Represent Women board members with us today. And she also runs um, the, the big movement is at the really cutting edge of the movement for uh, mailed ballots to all voters. So Amber, what Susanna did was talk a little bit about her work, what she's doing with Running Start, and then talks, talks a little bit about um, how it relates to represent women and dovetails nicely with the work that we're doing. So perhaps you could do the same. Welcome. Great. Well, thanks for having me. And I apologize for being tardy. I um, it's um, This is sort of a I don't know, a daily thing right now. But as uh, Cynthia mentioned, I run the National Vote at Home Institute. Um, as everyone can probably imagine on the call, we are um, in the middle of a national uh, crisis uh, with the pandemic and really uh, we're facing, you know, a lot of states that weren't adequately prepared um, to run elections in a pandemic. And so there's been a massive expansion of vote by mail and we're, we're working directly with states and localities across the country to try to help them get ready for November. So the, t the clock is ticking. There's a lot happening, a lot of legislation, a lot of moving parts. Um, but, you know, we're, we're engaged in that work very directly. Um, I, you know, I was saying to someone the other day, and I think it was so amazing to hear what Susanna just had to say, but then also Cynthia, um, is that in a lot of ways, uh, we're in the middle of a, a new and modern movement about expanding the, the franchise. And when the pandemic started to broil up, um, really what I think that did was expose the real vulnerabilities within our election system. So the act of voting and the voter registration plus actually casting a ballot, separating kind of other reforms like redistricting and open primaries and some and ranked choice, for instance. But just the act of casting a ballot has become particularly difficult in a pandemic. And what's interesting about that is uh, our work at the National Vote at Home Institute was really about expanding that option for all of the other benefits it provides, including convenience and security and um, you know, expanding options so that it's not just one day. Um, and knowing that the data points to an increase in turnout, we've seen that over time. So there are all kinds of benefits of voting at home, but the one that really has been, that's come up this year is certainly uh, providing voting in a safe and secure way in a pandemic when we're not supposed to crowd in large places and, you know, all of those things. And what's been fascinating for us in our work that we're doing is really to help states get ready for this increase because it's, it's not up to politicians, it's not up to elected officials, it's up to voters to decide how they want to vote and they can request to vote by absentee um, in most states, some with an excuse, but in most states without an excuse. And so we're seeing this huge increase and uh, my projection now is probably we're going to see about 60% plus of the country use absentee voting this year, uh, the first time that it'll ever be over 50%. And uh, we've seen it just do this massive expansion and we've never seen a system change so much so quickly. And that's really why the, the work this year has um, been magnified. And my mom said to me a few weeks ago, I had just done an interview um, and she kind of listened to it because she was visiting. And she said, you know, what's amazing is when I look back at suffrage and, and she's been reading a ton about suffrage this year and just getting really into it. She said, first, they didn't want women to vote. Then they didn't want minorities to vote. And now they don't want anyone to vote because we've got a pandemic. And I was like, well, that's, that seems to be the trend. So, um, so that's really uh, the work at least that I've been doing. I'm um, particularly happy and excited to be part of the board at Represent Women and supporting Cynthia's work um, because I'm convinced that until we fully have an inclusive democracy where representation is fair, representation is equal, um, then, you know, we're not going to see things really get better for our communities and for our children and for our families and for our colleagues and our friends um, in any, any meaningful way. Um, and I, um, the work I do, I obviously run a nonprofit. Formerly, I was an election official. Um, even in the nonprofit space, and I don't know if this has come up today, um, but even just fundraising, I've been struck by the frankly lack of women that are the funders, right? It's, it's, 
there's there's also a gender gap in the in the funder community um, with regards to support for nonprofits and in particular as it relates to democracy reform. And I think that's something too that we have to pay very close attention to. Um, the makeup of boards, not only at the corporate level, but also nonprofit level. Uh, one of the objectives I had when I came to be CEO at National Vote at Home was to diversify the board. Um, when I came on board, I was the only woman associated with the organization. Board, staff, I was the only woman. And now um, we're actually close to 50% board. Uh, we added Jennifer Granholm, who's the former governor of Michigan, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, who's the former lieutenant governor of Maryland, and also Kristen Strom, who runs a, a think tank in Colorado. Um, and we're working on expanding that diversity even more. But um, it was critical for me. And I kind of immediately said, we're going to fix this as soon as possible. Um, and I think we have to have that kind of commitment broadly, not just in corporate America, but also on nonprofit boards. Um, and then, and then the, the final thing I'll, I'll, I'll say, and then would love to take questions is, um, in terms of uh, representation in politics, I, uh, I'm actually an independent. I've thought about running for office a few different times, um, and I've been unaffiliated my, um, my career. So the way that I look at open primaries and some of these things is that again, people are somehow being locked out of the process. And, um, you know, I think we have to fully have an inclusive process. Uh, we have to think about what that looks like long term. But I think one of the ways to set the, set the pace and set, the, um, set things on track to make that happen is actually improving the voting transaction, meaning voter registration plus casting a ballot in a meaningful way. And you as a voter should not wait in line five or six hours to cast a ballot. And we've seen that in, in multiple cities around the country this year. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I think certain cities always get targeted. Like there was a ton of talk about Georgia, even though LA and Houston both had six hour lines actually longer than some of the places in Georgia. Um, but we see it in every state, regardless of the partisanship of a secretary of state, regardless of the city's partisan makeup, we just continue to see it. And it's really a symptom of a very big disease. And, and that disease is about bad policies and bad processes and a lack of funding and a lack of resources, all of which really create a very difficult voting experience for voters because ultimately voters are the ones that lose out. Um, and so I think if we can get the conduct of elections in a better place than what it is today, um, including voting at home, because I think that actually solves some of those problems, I believe it paves the way for a lot of other reforms that we want to get to, such as primary changes, ranked choice voting, different methods of um, of casting a ballot, um, along with you know lots of other democracy reform uh, changes. So I'm I'm convinced of that. That's kind of where I've uh, and that's where my expertise for sure is in terms of expanding the uh, opportunities that the electorate have and. Again, just really pleased to be part of, of this board and, and the work of Represent Women. Um, and as Cynthia mentioned, I did write a book about a lot of these things earlier this year. And prior to the pandemic, we haven't been able to do a lot of the planned events that we had, but uh, it is available on Amazon and Kindle. Um, and it's called When Women Vote. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Cynthia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amber. Yeah, we're, we're coming up uh, soon on the anniversary of the uh, Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention um, in 1848, when uh, that really launched the modern day era. I'm not sure there was an older era, but the modern day era of um, conversation about women's rights and and um, the push for suffrage itself, I think is a great example of um, women who recognized that there was a structural barrier to full participation as equals, to having equal opportunity to participate in much the same way that Title IX was a recognition of a structural barrier and the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, even the Americans with Disability Act, all were a package of systemic uh, solutions to uh, create equal opportunities for people to participate. So um, I think Amber's work fits right in. Uh, and one of the consequences of living in one of the world's oldest democracies is that we've inherited uh, by default, a series of old practices and systems which really need updating badly. And so um, sometimes when we think of reform, it feels like a big transformational cathartic change. But I think what Amber and many others who are doing great work in this reform movement really is about 
bringing everybody up um, to the modern era to 2020 um, so that we're building systems where everybody can participate, everybody gets a ballot, everybody has a voice in government, all those things that that I think that uh, Americans believe in, but we just haven't done the work to have the systems catch up. So anyway, thank you for that, all that work. Um, we could see, I guess if people, I can monitor the questions. So if people have questions for Amber, I'm happy to field them, but maybe we should um, go ahead and have more uh, uh, start with a little bit of a, a review of what uh, we're working on in terms of our uh, research agenda, um, which is um, impressive, I would say. Um, and then if, if there's a, somebody, if there's a question for Amber and Amber has to hop off, maybe I'll interrupt you more and we can, we can let Amber answer the question if that sounds good. That's great. Uh, yeah, I'll just briefly go over all of Represent Women kind of ongoing and upcoming research projects. First, I do want to plug our recently published PAC report, which really looks into the impact that both PACs and individual donors can have on getting more women elected because campaign finance reform isn't going to happen quickly enough to actually eliminate that as a systemic barrier for women. So I really do encourage everyone to go read that report. It is one of our many reports coming out. Um, next, we have our Ranked Choice Voting Decade in Review Report, which will be published later this week. Um, it really covers the successes that both women and people of color have found in Ranked Choice Voting jurisdictions over the past decade. It's being used across the country for many different um, elected offices, including mayoralships. The Jan Governor Janet Mills in Maine was just elected with Ranked Choice Voting in 2018, and Maine will be the first state to use RCV in a general election this fall. It also touches on the historic uses of ranked choice voting throughout the country with Cambridge being the oldest continuously, uh, the oldest locality to continuously use ranked choice voting. They've had it since the 1940s, as well as future legislation for ranked choice voting, which is going on throughout the country by many different groups and legislative action, so that's amazing. Next upcoming this summer is our 2020 Gender Parity Index, which we publish every year, and it is often a snapshot about women's representation at all levels of government, including the local, state, and federal levels, and we also include both historic and contemporary women in office. This year, however, in as a nod to the suffrage centennial, we are going to frame it around that and the fact that Women have had the right to vote for 100 years and we've held office for longer than that, but we still make up less than 25% of all elected officials. And that is unlikely to change by leaps and bounds until we address the systemic barriers, which all women face. Um, we are also gonna start working on a 2020 update to our international report, which often looks at all these systems around the world that are benefiting women. This includes gender quotas and other electoral systems such as ranked choice voting or single transferable voting, which has seen a lot of success in New Zealand. I think also looking at this from the lens of the global pandemic, many of the countries who have been able to successfully tamp down the pandemic are led by women and have a significantly higher number of women in legislative office than the US does. And then we have a few briefs coming up to include the tribal representation within tribal nations, because we do recognize the importance of local level offices that women can hold. And we often look at the city councils and state legislatures, but there hasn't been any widespread data collection on women within tribal councils. And that is an important stepping stone for native women. Currently, there's only two, and there's only ever been two Native women to serve in Congress. That's Deb Hallin from New Zealand and Sharice Davids from Kansas. So looking at more local level and stepping stones is also an important topic. Uh, our wonderful research interns are working on quite a few different projects, including a brief on incarcerated women since 1970, or 1980, the number of incarcerated women has actually increased by 750%. And that has a huge impact on how they're represented in office, especially with infringement on voting rights. There's also a brief being done on the party rules regarding gender. 
the most famous of which is the um, equal division rule, which was implemented in the 1970s by the Democratic Party and requires all convention delegates to be gender balanced. But every state and every local party do actually have rules that address the gender division of elected roles and appointed roles. And one of our interns talking today, Claire, has been working on that for the summer. There's also going to be updated research on women's representation within the US territories, which just due to a lack of available research hasn't been something we've been able to do more in depth, although we do touch on their current representation within all the territories in our gender parity index. That's a lot of good research. Well done, Maura. And Courtney, by the way, is the research director and she is working quickly to today focused on um, really trying to finish all the edits to the ranked choice voting report. So that's why she wasn't able to join us today, but she looks uh, forward to joining other editions of our speaker series. Um, I don't think there's any additional reports. I'm just trying to think what other research um, I think Maura has probably covered all of it. I, I will say um, before we turn to the interns experience that um, what we're trying to do at Represent Women is gather as much information on uh, rules and norms and systems that seem to be uh, connected to leading increases in women's representation so that we can figure out how to uh, visualize the data and package all that information uh, so that we can communicate it to allies. Um, I hope some of you are on the phone. We'll, we'll use that data information and then figure out how to help um, both allies and individuals um, advocate for changes in their communities. Um, and that, that advocacy can really take place at the local, state, and federal level. Uh, there's a lot going on um, that where there, there are levers of change really at every level. So um, there's lots to be done. And what our mission really is, is to, to look at what is impacting women's representation and look at the kinds of strategies that are data-driven uh, that really can lead to increases in women's representation across the board, across the geographic spectrum, ideological spectrum, age spectrum, uh, you name it. So that's really what our, our mission is all about. Do we want to go now to, I still don't see any questions popping up, but feel free to start opening uh, using that the question format um, and I will try to be attentive to those. And maybe, uh, Nicole, do we want to turn to to have the Represent Women interns share a little bit about their experiences? Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Um, and then if people have questions towards the end, we can answer them right at the end, or if not, um, just talk a little bit more maybe about the projects or something or something and like sort of how we go about like our mission statement. Um, so to reintroduce myself, if anyone's just getting on, um, I'm currently interning remotely as an outreach and advocacy intern um, and I'm a rising senior at Swarthmore. I'm majoring in peace and conflict studies and minoring in global and environmental studies. Um, so my areas of interest are human rights and sort of civil rights laws, which is what led me to be interested in interning for Represent Women since we strive for gender parity and supporting women in office. Um, and I think it's really important, especially for young women to see women actually running for and being elected into office um, and striving for like more diversity in all parties so that more voices are heard. Um, so on the outreach team for this summer, um, well, we've been focusing on creating this talk series to get more people involved um, and informed on just important voting reforms and also giving people tools to talk about women's representation in the US and internationally um, with our presentations that we create and using our and partner organizations research. Um, and we'll have all the presentations up on the website soon with a sort of like short guide or like blurb to um, who might be interested in using each presentation um, and how people can use them to advocate for women um, using all the research and resources that will be available also in um, sort of like handouts as well. Um, and so in terms of my personal experience interning this summer, um, it's been really rewarding and the remote experience is definitely unique, but I think everyone's been able to adapt pretty quickly. Um, 
and being remote does lead to like us being more independent and sort of makes us hold ourselves accountable more in terms of time management and picking projects um, and knowing like what we can and can't take on. But at the same time, like we on the, for the outreach team have worked closely with the communications team and other interns. Um, it's given us sort of like the independence to set up our own Zoom calls and meetings and create projects and talk to whoever um, would be interested in doing it and complete it with us. Um, and we have our weekly check-ins and so many just various people we can reach out to if there are like any questions ever. So I think it also working remotely builds sort of more trust amongst the whole team since everyone's expected to like do what they need to do to get their projects done and also collaborate when needed. Um, so for the recruitment process for interns, I know it's been updated to help sort of manage reviewing and contacting candidates better. Um, and we'll also send out the link to all the information that's on the webpage right now for the new intern portal. And the first deadline is July 24th um, and the process will be paused early if there are over 100 applicants and then also like roles will be reopened if they're um, undersubscribed. And the current available positions for um, the fall, which are all remote, are for the communications team, the outreach and advocacy team, um, nonprofit development and administration. Um, and I think all interns are, you know, provided with a lot of different trainings. Like even though I'm doing outreach and advocacy, um, I'm learning how to use Infogram and Canva and Nation Builder to edit the website and create graphics um, and work with other interns on the team. Um, so it's been really rewarding. I think you can make the most out of it and most out of like the time working remotely, like whether you're doing full time or part time. Um, it's also you know, nice that we can meet like our board members and meet like various people that are on the team and also work with other organizations in terms of like creating projects or even presentations um, and reaching out to like donors. And we also will start working, I think, more closely with the research team as like the reports come out. Um, we're creating sort of presentations and projects for them um, that come from them, which has been really rewarding and it's nice to have sort of everyone's voices heard, even though we're working remotely. Um, I think that's like an initial struggle is not being able to sort of just walk over to a desk and like talk to someone if you have questions, but then it sort of forces us to like create our own meetings and like know exactly like what we need to know and what questions we need to ask to make sure like everyone's on the same page. Um, and so Claire, who's also in the call, is on the research team, but she's a legal research intern. Um, so Claire, I think if you wanna take it away and sort of talk about your personal experience and how it's been working like with the rest of the interns this summer. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And Mara already did an awesome job talking about all the research that everyone's working on. Um, and. I have been, like like you said, since I'm a legal research intern, I know that my research internship is a little bit different than uh, how many of the other research interns are working. But this summer, uh, a lot of the things that Nicole said have been the same um, for me in terms of having weekly check-ins with uh, Cynthia, talking about our projects, um, and being able to try and um, continue to like, yeah, Still be interacting with all of the amazing people who are at Represent Women uh, simultaneously working on getting projects done from home, um, doing all that stuff that Nicole already touched on. But a little bit on my background for me, I graduated in 2017 from DePaul University, which is in Greencastle, Indiana. I had a communications degree and I knew that I wanted to go to law school, but I also wanted a break. So I spent actually two years off working at a nonprofit in Washington, DC. And then I just finished my first year of law school at Ohio State University, the Moritz College of Law. So I'm going into my second year. Was super excited about working at Represent Women because I am really passionate about voting rights law and um, something that Cynthia has said a few times and that some other people have repeated on this call is that um, the structure is so important 
Um, and so that's something that I was really, really uh, attracted me to want to intern with Represent Women is that uh, looking at the structure as well as giving people, women especially, um, the tools to be able to run, um, run, win, serve, and lead as the Represent Women uh, way is. Uh, is really, really important. So I love that. And as Nicole said, and Maura said, I'm working on finishing up right now a brief on gender party rules. And so as Maura said, uh, the equal division rule is a rule that is in place for the Democratic National Convention that every state delegation has to send a delegation that um, is equally divided amongst the genders. And so um, that is how works nationally, but also, as Mara said, there are a lot of really specific state rules um, and a lot of different ways to say that we want to strive to have more women involved in party politics. And I think a lot of the time women think of, oh, I want to get involved in politics. I'm going to run for Congress. I'm going to run for the state house. I'm going to run for uh, governorship. But it's also really important to have women involved on the local political level, level and attending conventions and um, doing other things. And what I've re realized and recognized in my research is that it's so important to have those ways because in some ways that's how women realize that they would want to run for office in a more official capacity by working more closely with members of their party, by working, um, working in uh, other in close proximity with people who are working for their parties. And so the Democratic Party has the equal division rule, but the Republican Party has a rule that says every state shall endeavor to send an equal uh, like delegation um, to the national part uh, national convention. And that really does change the way and the percentages of women that are being sent on behalf of each state uh, party to the national conventions. And so it's been really interesting to see like the percentages, the way that uh, each state party says we are striving to have more equal representation, but um, also get to look at it from a legal lens too. So one thing that I've had the privilege of doing at Represent Women is looking and doing the research into some of what the party rules are, and then also looking at them from a legal lens, asking why is this um, legal that you're allowed to have a rule that says you must send a delegation that has half half men and half women. Finding out, looking at like previous cases in which they have been, um, they have said, oh, this is allowed or this, this level isn't allowed. And then hopefully being able to apply how and why these rules are allowed to exist to potentially other areas of politics. So we can continue to promote equal representation or more balanced representation um, in other areas. Yeah, that's a great summary, Claire. I think that it is really, it's important to understand what is happening right now, like what are the rules that have been put in place? And then as you suggested, how can we use those as a framework uh, to expand the use of similar rules to create uh, incentives for parties to recruit more women candidates and PACs to support more women? And I think the maybe the, the central theme or the common theme or thread is that um, it's about trying to get decision makers, gatekeepers, people who have power to become agents of change in some way, to recognize their power and to make a commitment that's public, that there's some accountability for that they're going to um, uh, you know, set a higher target for the amount of money they give to women candidates or set a, make a commitment to recruit more women to run for office. There, there are these terrific programs out there that are preparing individual women to run, but they're not always connected with the party leaders who are looking for candidates to run. So it's a very, it's a, a fairly simple procedure, I think, to, to figure out how to build more relationships there and then more accountability. Um, it reminds me of another kind of a, an accountability uh, that we're dabbling in a little bit, but is the um, getting executives who are naming cabinets to, to make a commitment to a gender balanced cabinet. Of course, 
it's ideal when that happens at the federal or national level, as has tr been true in a few countries, um, Macron famously and Trudeau and, and uh, the president of Ethiopia and South Africa made the same commitment. But we can also do that with governors in this country uh, to make sure that they are advocating or making a commitment uh, to a, uh, an inclusive um, and diverse and, and ideally gender balanced cabinet. So that's, that gives people a sense of the kinds of interventions that we're looking at. Um, and in many ways, it's a great time to be doing this work because many of these strategies we know work either in other countries or in other contexts, but ex it's exciting to try to figure out how to make them work in this American political context. Um, so that's what we're really, we're, we're really all about. I'm just looking to see if there are any questions and answers. Um, no, no questions yet that I can see, but feel free to chime in um, if you've got any questions. Um, and Thea, I do see a question. Yeah, it's just in the, in chat. the chat. People do have other questions. You can also just click on the Q&A section, but the chat also works well. Gotcha, okay. Okay, we have a question from Zoe, whichever I guess everybody can see, but I'll read it so that the other, um, the attendees uh, know what it is. I'm running Start alum, thank you for joining, and a very active member with my local party. I also happen to be a lobbyist. How can I help be a better leader as an advocate for women to participate in politics in this way? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, Claire, I don't know whether you wanna take a stab at answering that. First? Yeah, I'd be happy to, and then please add whatever I've forgotten or, or what other whatever spurs your spurs your knowledge about it too. So I would say one of the most important things that you can do, and this is kind of a plug for the work that I'm doing, but is to start a conversation and look at the the data when it comes out. I think that one thing that I noticed and that I experienced going through the research process was that information, especially about party rules and party delegations, is not really uh, put together anywhere. And people aren't having conversations across the country about these delegations being balanced. And so I think at the very local level, starting a conversation about ways that we can uh, further women in politics is something that uh, is a step that seems simple, but is one that I've noticed not a lot of people have taken. So I would say that's one of the first things that uh, you can do. And I hope that we're able to, um, when we are releasing the, the research and the information, the brief that uh, we're working on about the party delegates, that people are able to use that, look at the data of what's happening in their own state um, and across the country and be able to actually uh, continue to implement more rules so that there is more of a balance. So that was my, that's my top thing that I would say. Cynthia, what else do you have to add? Yeah, for sure. I um, agree with all of that. I would say um, really uh, using all of the technology that's at our fingertips um, to visu help visualize the data, I think that really helps for people to see. Like Amber's work is so effective, I think, because she can show that states that have voted home and mail, mail ballots that you don't have to request, but you just get, have dramatically increased rates of participation and turnout. It's very hard to argue with data that's as clear and compelling as that. And I think um, though though all of our work doesn't have quite as clear a, um, uh, a, a result, at least right now, because we are in many ways, it's, it's, uh, we're at the beginning of conversations with PACs, for example, or party leaders about setting targets. I do think that people um, leaders of those institutions really respond to um, uh, not only how well they're doing, but how well they're doing um, compared to their peers. So as an example, one of the things that, uh, you know, Maura worked super hard. We really appreciate her work on the PAC and the donor report. And um, I believe some of the interns helped to create these case studies that look at PAC giving to women candidates in the 2018 election cycle, and then compare that to other PACs in their sector. So we looked at Google and Twitter and Amazon, and um, then the PACs feel competitive with one another or 
we hope that they do, uh, to do a better job um, at supporting women candidates. Um, so I think that, you know, again, not only showing the numbers, but showing how they compare, um, you know, how the Republican state party in Pennsylvania is doing at recruiting women candidates compared to the Republican party in Virginia, for example. Um, I th really think that helps. And, um, I think figuring out how to tell stories that are individualized as well, people really respond to narratives. So um, being able to tell, uh, lift up a story of a, of a woman who was recruited to run by her state party or at the local level and how um, having a rule that, uh, or a target for a party um, that they had to meet, um, uh, having a story about that rule, I think helps as well. And I think that's one thing that uh, we just haven't had the, the capacity to do yet. But I think that that's the kind of thing, both the numbers and the narratives can be powerful in, um, in getting people to understand the information and then figure out how to take action. What would you add more? Have I missed anything in our, our yeah, list? Part of the compelling story is that is why we look at international research where some of these rules aren't necessarily in place in the US, they have been in place in other countries and oftentimes those countries are doing better at electing women, whether it's because of one single rule or a combination of rules or also a difference of kind of how people look at elected office. Um, so really like trying to find comparative studies from all across the spectrum not just within federal politics or local level politics or even the US, but just all over the world and in private corporations as well. Yes, and I, I think the framing of it is awfully important. There's, there's so many good um, uh, uh, useful information out right now uh, about um, the ways that people perceive fairness and for people who are in positions of power, often they feel like they're going to lose something um, if, the, if the pie is expanded. But in reality, really everybody benefits when uh, everybody's participating in, in democracy um, on the level playing field. And so I think being careful about how we're framing it and framing it as um, this evolution of American democracy. Uh, I often use the John Adams quote uh, that um, while didn't really work out this way, but some of the founders, I think, had a conception of of the House of Representatives, at least, being a portrait of the people in miniature and really using the the language and the the founding of of America as this uh, pluralistic um, leader in democracy. I think that that helps to tell the story as well. That we are we're 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 pushing we're advocating for all these systems changes. Uh, so that we can help fulfill the promise of democracy that we know a lot of people really do adhere to and care about. Uh, one thing I'll just say while I have the floor is that um, it can, it's exciting sometimes to be on panels, but often on a panel back in the old days when we used to go fly places and, you know, get a hotel and a rental car and go to the panel and I'd be talking about what Moore was saying, well, the United States ranks 85th or whatever, and all these other countries are doing that. Um, so many panelists so often would say, yes, but we can't do that here. And I would say, who, who says what we can do? Of course, we, we, can, we can do a lot here. You know, we're a leader in, in the democratic world. Um, so I think part of it is maybe repositioning ourselves to think, wow, we really have the capacity to change a lot. I, you know, there's, there's, um, there's very little that's in the US Constitution that says anything about voting. Really, the only clause is about um, House elections. House members have to be elected every two years. Doesn't say you know, which two years. It can, there's really a lot of, um, of uh, chance to um, make the system better that's within our reach that doesn't require constitutional change, that's simple legislative change or um, change through constituent you know, referendums and initiative processes as well. So that's an also um, something that's available. And Claire has something to add. Yes, I wanted to add one more thing. Uh, I actually heard this anecdote from one of my mentors who works on the Hill and uh, she was talking about there being uh, um, some sort of policy conversation about childcare in the House of Representatives. And unfortunately the conversation was scheduled to happen at like seven or 7.30 at night. So 
I say that just to say, I think that in terms of women participating in politics, also being understanding that um, sometimes women who want, like who need or are going to relieve someone of childcare um, might not be able to participate in a conversation at seven o'clock at night, even though it's about childcare. So I think uh, one, one way is to make, also make that the ways that you want women to get involved accessible for women who choose to like want to have childcare responsibilities. Um, that, that applies to things like across the board. If you're going to have a meeting at eight o'clock at night, that might work for some people. But if, if I have to go and uh, let my sitter off or I have to go and do something else, like that could be something stopping from someone from wanting to get involved. Claire, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, as Cynthia knows, I'm actually a single parent of, um, I have a seven and nine year old and um, <clears throat> the pandemic has been pr particularly difficult, but it's um, even more difficult when you work 14 hours a day on Zooms and all of that kind of stuff plus. Um, but you know, what's interesting too is there's very few single mothers that are elected in any state legislative body or um, in Congress certainly. And I think part of it is that it's so difficult uh, to, to do that. And so there's an underrepresentation even just based on logistics and, and difficulty with some of these things as well. And so there's really, I think an opportunity to modernize, to make sure those voices are heard because uh, those voices have been left out for, for a long period of time as well. Yeah, that's, the, that's so true. We, um, I live in Maryland and uh, until about eight years ago, there were no women's restrooms in the office buildings just because there weren't enough women. So the women would have to leave the, um, the, the Capitol and go walk to some unknown building to, to use a restroom. So that's the, the kind of thing I just feel like we do. It would be great to have the, you know, the list of 100, like Martin, Luther, the Martin Luther's theses of things that, look, you got to do all these things in order for there to be a, a level playing field and certainly access to childcare. And now with the advent of greater uh, virtual technology, I think that's going to be a way for a lot of people to participate because it's not just single moms, but it's it's younger people or people who are elderly abled or people who need um, language interpretation, all, all kinds of things um, are, are things that we need to be uh, figuring out how to provide access and, and level that playing field. Um, thanks so much, Amber. You've got to hop off. Uh, we'll be in touch soon. Great to have such terrific board members who have so much expertise. So we have a question um, from one of the attendees that I will um, uh, read. And if people have a uh, answer uh, on the tip, top of their lips, I can let you answer or I can take a stab at it. How can religious communities who can be very closely involved at local level of politics for advocacy be more influential in helping elect more women? Anybody have any thoughts on that? I have just like musings. I don't have any research or data to back it up, but I mean, I was raised in a Catholic household and went to Catholic school up until I went to college. And in that community, religious leaders can be very influential in how they speak to their parishioners, or in my case, the nuns who are our homeroom teachers and would interact with us on a daily basis. And they have, they can be extremely influential if they talk to these, talk to their community and they have a level of authority to say, look, we want more women in office. We believe women should be in power and we want to support that. Um, I mean, I don't, I think making it aware that like, if you have different political beliefs than your religious leader, that you're still open to running for office, having a different belief doesn't mean you are not a part of that religious community anymore. You can support both. Yes, for sure, Maura. And um, I think there's also the, the, sometimes I think there's consternation about the tax identities of organizations. And if you're a 501c4 versus a 501c3, but of course there's so much education, even if a church is a, I mean, churches are 501c3s, um, so they're not technically supposed to be advocating um, for candidates and so forth. Um, uh, but I think there's quite a bit of education that can be done um, with, with, you know, outside of the service um, and with youth groups and so forth. And um, often just it's as simple as hosting events. Uh, quite often nonprofits are struggling to find the place to, you know, in the 
the days that we will, uh, I think, resume going to public spaces and meetings, um, holding public spaces and meetings, and then helping to hold virtual events also uh, with leaders in the community, I think, and having a conversation about the data, and then um, really pivoting to what you can do in your community. Um, what kinds of systems changes can you can advocate for? Um, I think that's a great a great model to follow. And religious communities are often um, so much the um, you know foundational infrastructure for a community. They have a really important job to play. Yeah, and I'll add too that I think if a religious mentor came to me and said, "Have you ever thought about running?" That would be like very influential mm -hmm. to me. And I think that. Um, Represent Women has some great data that I don't remember right now about, uh, like, if someone has asked uh, a woman to run versus how many, what percentage of men have had someone say, you should run for office. Um, and I think that, that, that that's definitely something that can do, especially knowing that people who are um, religious mentors for others could do a lot of good by simply asking a woman who they see has qualities to become a leader if they've ever considered running for office as well. Yeah, that's a great point. A key gatekeeper for sure. Yeah, going off of that, I believe it was in this most recent Canadian elections in the fall, they did a real push to increase the number of women candidates and organizations found you had to ask women about nine times to run before they would really consider it but men were more likely to come to the organizations and say, I think I'm qualified to run and I'm going to. So there's just that, I guess everyone in the community, if you see a woman that you think would be a great leader is ask them and ask them again, because it does take multiple people, multiple times to kind of get through to women and say, you are a qualified person to run for office. Yeah. I'm picturing churches and synagogues and, uh, mosques and other places being giant uh, day, uh, child care centers also you could come into a shift to free young parents up who want to run for office could um, then the kids could learn about democracy there's a great our member of congress has a democracy summer program that they do where they have a huge crew of interns every summer who go do good works around democracy so that's a whole extending that idea of civic learning and understanding how systems work and what we can change and all that um, so many opportunities there Great, any other questions before we wrap things up? Thoughts from other um, interns? I'm happy to have to hear from, we looks like we've got a couple interns, current interns on the line, if anybody wants to join. Is there a way that I should see that our people, Paula or Terrell, Taylor, do you have anything to add? Hi, um, I'm Taylor. I'm a communications intern. I don't know if I'm, if I'm, am I on video or no? No video, just your voice. Okay. Um, so I work on the communications team and we do social media and work on bringing represent women's research and message um, to everyone. And um, it's been really awesome this summer working with um, the other intern, Casey, on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and I've really enjoyed being able to kind of work in all of the different areas of our research, um, our ranked choice voting report and our PAC report. If you guys go on our social media, you can see some of the graphics that we made. And um, it's been really um, cool to see it being shared really widely, especially our ranked choice voting um, graphics have been shared really widely within the ranked choice voting community um, that has so many different partners on Twitter and on um, other forms of social media. So I really enjoyed um, my internship this summer and I encourage people to apply in the fall if they're interested. Thanks, Taylor. Paula, do you have anything you wanna add? I could go ahead and just add also that another thing that's been really just so useful for me for the summer um, is sort of even going about our schedules and stuff and how we've created it and how flexible it is. And like, I know that there's at least 
one intern who's um, from England, I think. So like people are on different time zones, but like everyone's working well to make sure like it's very organized knowing like I can check to see like when someone else or another intern on my team is actually like working or whether they have the day off or not to, you know, create like a Google calendar invitation and to talk to whoever we need. Um, so it's been very flexible. So in terms of like, if there are any like potential interns or anyone interested in applying, um, I think you can definitely still do the internship and get the most out of it while having classes. Since like for me, all my classes will be online for the fall. Um, so whether you're taking like a lot of classes or not, or whether like one day you're working only in the mornings or you could only work in the afternoons and stuff, I feel like everyone has been really helpful and flexible. Um, so it's definitely doable. And I think if anything, everyone will be more sort of used to working online and working remotely. Um, so I just encourage anyone who's interested in applying. Hi, Cynthia. Um, I don't know if you guys, oh, I think you can hear me. Sorry that I was trying to figure out my mute and unmute. Um, so really quickly, <laughs> um, first of all, I'm super happy that we're having this webinar. And um, I am an outreach intern. I'm Paola Morales. I am also a student at the George Washington University, and I work with Nicole in the outreach team, along with Anna, um, the other outreach intern. And yeah, like I I just really think that this internship has given me so many tools. Like I've been learning so much. I've been being able to have these types of conversations with um, within my team and just being able to promote um, this wonderful organization that is Represent Women is really cool. And I really, um, as well as everyone else has mentioned, I really encourage for other people to apply for this internship and um, just practice like your all of your skills, honestly, like I've been doing everything from like graphics to networking to a little bit of everything, which is really, really amazing. So yeah. And thank you all for joining. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. We had, I can't remember what the total number was, about 150 applicants for the summer. And we turned down obviously a lot of people, but we have a terrific team and we're really looking forward to working with a wider, um, you know, a, a group of people in the fall and the winter. And I think there's some interesting possibilities on the horizon uh, for building a um, sort of a virtual uh, think tank of sorts uh, where we can provide some nominal support uh, to, to support research and inquiry into these things as students go uh, through their careers, maybe to graduate school, maybe to law school, maybe uh, to a job, um, to try to, to build more community around these research topics. And so so stay tuned for more of that. Um, there's, uh, there's some potential funding and we're looking at trying to figure out what that might look like. Um, so that's an exciting thing I think as well to, to not just have it be a one-off that you're here for the summer and then you're gone and we never hear from people again, but that we're really tracking people who uh, have worked with Represent Women um, and, and uh, have interesting thoughts to share and research topics um, and trying to put it all together in the same place so that we can support one another in this work. That's our, our general goal for sure. Well, thanks. Maybe that's a good, uh, to anybody else have anything to say? I'll check the questions one more time. Thank you so much for the, to the organizers of this event and the attendees and the panelists, to the terrific interns, um, the current terrific interns. And if there's anybody lingering on the call who's a future potential intern, uh, we're excited that you're, you've joined us. And remember, everybody take a look, Google Declaration of Sentiments. And I, I promise you that if you read it to yourself, you'll be, um, I think, maybe unpleasantly uh, surprised at how w true those words still ring um, all these many years later, 172 years later, I guess it is, um, since the 1848 convention. So that's your homework assignment for the week um, is, uh, to, to skim the Declaration of Sentiments and see how wise and um, prescient those um, uh, women's representation advocates were in, in the hot summer days of July, 1848. Thanks everybody. If you're interested in applying, the applications are open till July 24th and all the information's on our website. So do check it out and apply. Yeah, and check out all of our social media accounts. Mora has written dozens of interesting blogs on our Medium account, so check that out. And of course, we're 
we are trying to build a presence on LinkedIn and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can help us out in that way just by helping to engage on all those platforms. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Hello. Back next week, same time, same place. Bye. Thank you.